This week, I got to interview one of my favorite drummers from my favorite band. This is Jerry Gaskill from the legendary alternative rock band. I guess they're considered, they're like the, a band that, that, that sits between alternative rock and metal, depending on which era you're coming from. But the great band King's X, they just put out a new record. Make sure I get the title correct. It is called Three Sides of One. That just came out a couple weeks ago. It's a really, really, I mean, consistent. King's X has been consistent. There's going to be great riffs. There's going to be strong, simple meat and potatoes grooves with some cool extra nuance, really interesting vocals, um, you know, gorgeous harmonies, all that kind of stuff. So they're a really, really great band. And Jerry's just, just a cool guy, good hang, great drummer. So here's my hang with Jerry Gaskill. He doesn't really talk too much about gear, so I got as much as I could out of him. But this is more of a general conversation about being a drummer in a band for this long and, and how they do what they do. So check it out. Jerry Gaskell. Yeah, how do you uh, stave off back pain as a drummer? That's my question for everyone. I'm dealing with it. Man. Really? I, I've i never really had back pain as a drummer, although I do have a herniated disc. But I don't think it's from drumming. Hmm. It doesn't bother me though. It, it, it bothered me many, many years ago to the point where I, I felt like I couldn't even, I couldn't even walk. I wanted to write a country song called "Sciatica's Got the Best of Me," you know. <laughs> but uh, it, it, it really doesn't even bother me at all anymore. So that's interesting. That doesn't affect you when you're playing. Not at all. Nothing. No. No. Well, knock on wood. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Things, things seem to go well when I'm when I'm playing. Now, that seems to be the least of my problems. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, congratulations on the new record. It's your 13th studio record. First one since 2008, which I couldn't believe it was that long of a gap between. seems like that was just yesterday. But, um, yeah, I feel like you guys need to, um, in addition to being a legendary rock band, you should be relationship counselors. <laughs> How does a band stay together that long? Original lineup, everything. I know we get asked that question a lot. And um, I think my answer is always when we first got together, we really felt that this is the band we wanted to be in. We, these are the guys that we all three wanted to play with. It just felt right. And we just gave everything to it. And then as time went on, the only thing I can think is that that was something truly to believe in or we're just stupid. No, I don't know. One or the other. <laughs> but we're still together. We're still making music, and I'm, and I'm happy with what we're doing. I mean, I, I love I love the new record. I enjoyed yeah, making it. it that, I really enjoyed making it. Was anything different about the writing process for this one versus previous records? I think the only difference is that it was what we're doing now. You know, because there's never there's no real formula on how we write songs. You know, we all write songs. We all bring them in, or we write them together. Whatever. We've done it all those different ways. So this was just uh, us getting together after however many years it was. Was it like 13 years or something like that? Or 12 years? Whatever it was. Uh, well, it was 2008, the last record came out. We got together in 2019. It's like 11 years since we'd recorded together. So there was that newness. and uh, But for me, it was a great experience. I, I, I totally enjoyed making this record. As much as uh, making a record is full of, uh, you know, depression and terrible things and all of that, you know, uh, I totally enjoyed it and I'm, and I'm happy with the product. Was it like riding a bike or did you have to kind of knock some rust off as a band? Uh, I think it was kind of like riding a bike, but I always feel like we're, we're, we're uh, knocking dust off all the time. Or rust, whatever you, whatever the word was, rust, yeah, all the time. And that's just, that's what life is. I mean, every day I wake up, oh, i got to get rid of this rust. i got to get rid of that rust. got to figure out how to make it through this. You know, that's just life, right? So with this batch of songs, how, much, how many of them were completely written and brought in versus ideas that were fleshed out as a group? Hmm. I know that Ty and I both brought in like three or four songs that we had com you know, pretty much completed a demo for them. And Doug had all kinds of songs that we didn't know anything about until we got there, for the most part. And uh, so I think we all had songs written when we got there, 
But that, but at the same time, once we start working on those songs together, they may or may not turn into something different where we're all putting our ideas into it. So I think songs were pretty much written before we got there. And we just took it from there and turned them into whatever they are now. How do you write? Do you write with guitar? I I usually write with guitar. I've written a, a few songs on piano. And most most songs I've written are on guitar. Not that I'm a guitar player, not that I'm a piano player either, but that's just how I write songs. <laughs> now, do you write them in the style of King's X or do they become King's X? I think they just become King's X. I just write songs to write songs. And uh, I don't have anything in mind for it to sound like anything in particular. You know, if an idea comes to me, I just do it and I go with it. And it turns into a song. If I like it, I present it or I put on a solo record or whatever. But uh, I have nothing in my mind as I go into writing a song other than, hey, I want to write a song. So how did, what, what was on your demos? Were they, did you do full arrangements? Like how? Pretty much. Uh, I worked with a friend of mine. We worked together to record them. And he helped me actually write one of the songs, uh, Take the Time, off the new record. And uh, She Called Me Home was another one, and Holidays. Those were all songs that basically they were completely written and somewhat arranged. And that's what I presented to the band. So what is your background? Did drums come first or some other instrument? Drums always come last for me. When I'm writing a song, drums are the very last thing I'm even thinking about. And once I get the song done, I said, oh, okay, let's see if I can... Uh, put some drums on this now. And that's how it comes about for me. Because drums, I don't know, it's a weird thing. I know I'm a drummer, but drums are always, you know, the last thing I think about. You know, I, I just like to write the song, like to have the melody and the structure. And then uh, if drums fit, they fit. And hopefully I can make that happen. <laughs> have you had any songs that drums didn't fit? Yes, I have some songs there. there. There are no drums at all. Like Take the Time, when I presented that to uh, the band, there are no drums on that one at all. But we ended up putting drums on it. Because when we were in the studio, I just thought, hey, I think I should play this with some brushes, just some nice, soft drum things happening. And I think it worked out really well. And there's a lot of songs on my first solo record that have no drums on them. Or a few songs. Two or three. Two, maybe three, whatever. So... How do you, so when you're presented with songs from the other guys, how do you, first of all, are there drums on them or, you know, do you offer input? Like, I'm curious of the dynamic of having three songwriters in a band. Well, most likely when, when, when a song is brought to us, uh, it has, you know, all the parts on it for the most part. It does, usually has drums, you know, program drums, usually. And, uh, and, and once you hear something like that, at least for me, it's always hard to get those ideas out of your head because that's what you're listening to. And you're thinking, even if you feel something different, that still just kind of seems to be stuck there in my head. But I try to put myself into it and, uh, you know, make it feel more like myself, which I think I do because I think whenever I play anything, even if I'm trying to play it exactly like somebody else, it still ends up sounding like me for some reason. So, so there's that. What little changes do you make? Is it nuances or is it you know, bass drum patterns? What ends up shifting? It could be all of that. Yeah, it could be uh, nuance is a good one. Definitely nuance. But uh, like, for instance, uh, there's a song called Swipe Up on the new record. There's also one called Flood Part One, where Doug, Doug is very into Meshuggah. And I remember when he played those, he played the demo for uh, Swipe Up and ended up being Swipe Up. We kind of changed it around a lot. But uh, when I first heard that, I thought, oh my God, it's great, Doug. But, you know, I don't play drums like that at all. That is not what I do. And I was excited and fearful at the same time, thinking, oh my God, what am I going to do with this? I don't play like that. You know, and it ended up me not playing like that at all, which I think is great. I think Ty at one point said, uh, just, just play it like you would play it. Play it like Bonham might play it, which I, which I did, and uh, 
has a completely different feel now, and uh, and 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 I and I can get behind it. it it's it's me now. It's me playing drums. And I become a king. Became a king's exo. Have you ever played double bass? I did when I was a teenager. Then I quickly got rid of that. <laughs> I never felt like a double bass player. All my favorite drummers are play the same setup that I use right now, except for Carmine. Carmine was a favorite, and he used double kick. Who are some of your favorites? Well, uh, Ringo was definitely a first favorite. Buddy Rich was a first favorite. Uh, then from there, John Bonham is a favorite. Don Brewer is a favorite. Uh, Carmine Apiece is a favorite. Uh, and I always say if I had to choose perfect drumming, it would be John Bonham and Buddy Rich somehow melded together into one drummer. And to me, that would be absolutely perfect drumming. Well, I can't go wrong with those choices. I think Don Brewer might be the one that I wouldn't have thought of, but now it makes perfect sense being a singing drummer in a rock band. Sometimes I feel I feel like I play most like Don Brewer. That's interesting. I was trying to think this morning, like, who does Jerry sound like? And I should have thought of that. <laughs> but like I said earlier, I try to if I try to sound like somebody, like if I try to do something like John Bonham or anybody, it always just ends up sounding like me. Now, I don't know if that's a good thing, a bad thing, or whatever, but it's just the thing. That's the way it is. <laughs> Let's talk about the gear you used to record. What was the kit? Well, actually, uh, uh, when I got there, uh, Michael Parnon, and we did it at Black Sound Studio, which is Michael Parnon, in, uh, in Pasadena, I think it was, or somewhere in L.A., and uh, he had a kit there. And I said, well, let me just try that kit. And that's what I end up using for most of the record, except for Take the Time. And I used a, a Dixon kit, which is what I which I which is what I normally use live. And you know, whenever I play, I use Dixon. And that's what I used on uh, Take the Time with, with the brushes and all, which I thought was perfect. Hmm. But all the other songs were the the house kit from Michael Parnon. I don't even remember what they were. Was it your normal sizes or was it something different? Yeah, basically my normal sizes. Although I only used one uh, floor tom. I usually use floor toms, two floor toms. and uh, But they sounded good. They felt good. I said, hey, let's just do that then. We're making a record. Let's, let's use what's, 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 what's working. You know, we would just, we would use like a different snare for every song practically. You know, we try to get the sounds that felt right for each song. So we worked quite a bit on this record make it what it is were the snares at the studio or did you bring in your own uh there were some snares there uh greg bissonette brought in some snares for me which was very nice and uh i remember he brought a snare for me to use on the ear candy record many years ago and i ended up using that on the record and he told me once he heard the record and heard that snare on there he can never play it again so he just gave it to me <laughs> And now it sits in my basement with all my other snares. <laughs> Do you remember what drum it was? What It was a Slingerland. It's a Slingerland. No kidding. Yeah. <laughs> what were the snares on this record? Do you remember them? Oh, man, I don't. I am so not a gear guy that I just don't even think about that stuff. If it feels right, if it sounds right, I go with it. So is the process just grab a drum, however it's tuned, try it. If it's cool, use it. If it's not, get a different drum or were you retuning? That's exactly what we did. We tried different snares and, you know, because we felt the vibe of the song. We thought, hey, this might need a, 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 a deeper snare, you know, to get that, that kind of tone. And we tried. If it didn't work, we tried to tune it. If it did work, then we'd go with another snare until we found what we felt worked. Interesting. Yeah. I'm always curious, then, what is it that makes you say that's the right drum for this song? Uh, for me, a lot of it is feel. Things have to feel right for me. But when you're making a record, there's, you have to consider the tone as well. And I depended on Michael quite a bit when we were, when we were getting sounds. You know, if it felt right, I thought, hey, this feels good. And he would say, hey, yeah, that, that sounds good. That's going to work with this song. And we go with it. What about live? Do you carry multiple snares or you roll with one? Um, 
That'd be a, that'd be a good question for my tech. <laughs> mm. I think there's got to be at least at least two snores. I know there's at least two. Because if something happens to one, I'm going to have to have another one pretty quickly. So I but you're not probably, swapping them out in the middle of shows or anything. Only if need be, yeah. Like if a, if a head breaks or something, we have to have another snare ready rather than take time to change the head and put it back on. We have to have one ready to go. So I'd say there's at least two, maybe three. I don't know. Uh, did you record live as a band or was it overdub sessions? For the most part, we, we did the basic tracks live. And of course, from there, there's a lot of overdubbing. But we wanted to get a band feel. We've always done that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Click track or no click? Click track, yeah. Which is a good thing and a bad thing. You know, because it, it, it keeps the groove there. Yet at the same time, it can hinder the feeling you inside of the groove, if that makes any sense, because there's not much room to, to waver when you're playing with a click. There's a very, very small margin that you can waver or get around when using a click. And uh, I think I use that a lot just to get the feel because if it's right on the click, I mean, I don't know if anybody plays right on, maybe they, maybe they do, but right on, you might as well just use a drum machine or just program it. You know, because it's not going to have a feeling to it then. It's just going to sound like, you know, programmed drums, right? Mm -hmm. Unless you're like an, an absolutely incredible drummer that plays perfectly in time all the time. Which I don't now know. What about I mean. earlier records? Is do you always use a click, or is this a more recent thing? Yeah, from the first record, we, we've used a click. Yeah, I think there's a couple songs we didn't use a click. Like I think "Moan Jam" off of a uh, "Faith, Hope, Love." We didn't use a click on that. I think the end of uh, Visions off the first record, we didn't use a click for that. But for the most part, yeah, we, we, we use a click. What about live? Never, never live. So have you felt that the tempos need to change when you play these songs on stage in front of a crowd? I don't know if I feel they need to, but I'm sure they do. <laughs> 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 you know, I, I, I start songs the way I feel them and... Hopefully it's not too fast or too slow. Sometimes it is. And oh, sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it's right. Sometimes it's wrong. But you go with it. What are you going to do? Right? Yeah. <laughs> so you don't have a metronome on stage that you start off with or anything? I do off not. Field. Maybe I should, but I don't. That's great. <laughs> yeah. I've not done a lot of things I probably should. <laughs> <laughs> are you guys going to be touring this record? Yeah. We've done three shows already. Truth the first three shows we've done in two and a half years. Mm. And uh, I just remember thinking, I don't even know if I can do this anymore. If I even want to do this. I think we we're all nervous about it because it's been so long and, and we learned new songs off the record. And, uh, and as soon as I got on stage, it's like, Oh my God, this is what I do. You know, I, I think, I think I'll continue doing this. <laughs> you know, it was nice to see the crowd out there. It was sold out in New York. It was actually incredible, and it reminded me of who I am, which was a very, very good thing for me because I was I was losing myself, man. You know, through this whole, uh, I guess, the pandemic and the change in the world. I mean, everybody's been through it, right? And it just got to a point where I just didn't know what to think or feel anymore. You know, right felt wrong, wrong felt right, everything in between was like, I'm sure we all felt that way, but I only care about myself. You know, that's all I have to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> That's what did you do to I occupy about, your, I care about other people what did you do to occupy your your time like, creatively over the past two and a half years well what i did i've been threatening for many years i'm going to build myself a little studio at home so i can record other than just garage band and during the pandemic that's exactly what i did and i spent a lot of the time just writing songs and recording them and learning how to operate all this cue base and stuff which was absolutely incredible for me I'm very glad I, I I have that now. So is there a solo record in the works? Oh, there's a solo record in the works, yeah. No doubt about nice. it. I don't know when, but it's coming. <laughs> Do you ever play out as a solo artist? I have. On my first record, I did like three or four shows, which again, to me, was incredible. I remember um, I had a great band, uh, uh, Dan Carcos, who I did my second record with, he was one of the guitar players. Matt Farley played drums. John Farley played bass. 
and Andy Black. Black Sugar was on guitar as well, a great guitar player, all great musicians. I felt like I was the weakest link in the band, actually. But I was the front guy. And uh, it was incredible. I remember being really, really nervous before the first show. We rehearsed. We felt like we knew what we were doing. But I was so nervous because I'd never done that. I played a little bit of guitar. And uh, I was sang, you know, just standing up front singing. I've never done this in my life. But I remember as soon as we started, I think it was after the first, during the first song, am I allowed to, am I allowed to say words that start with F? <laughs> sure. <laughs> during the first song, I walked over to Dan and said, I think I can motherfucking do this motherfucking shit. <laughs> That's how excited I was. I just said, I can do this. And it was a great show. Man. The place was packed. It was awesome. And I just want to do more. I tried to do something for the second record, but it just we just couldn't make it happen financially and all that stuff. So. Yeah, it terrifies me to think about getting behind, out from behind the drum set and being that vulnerable in front of a crowd. I wouldn't be able to do it. I had to feel so foreign. It was very foreign, but like I said, I can motherfucking do this motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> because they're my songs and I, and I, you know, I just had to do it. I had to do it. And I play, I play locally around town, too. I play drums in, in, in some local bands around town, which is very fun. And you're in Houston now? No, I'm in New Jersey. Red Bank, oh. New Jersey. Why did your number come up as Houston, Texas? Because I still have a Houston, Texas number. Oh. I figured I had it for so many years. Why change it? Because everybody <laughs> okay. has it, you know? Well, it's funny you say you're not really a gear guy because I feel like your sound is so so consistent and identifiable and like I would think you you're very meticulous about the gear you use and the sound that you get well my opinion on that is a lot of what we do as musicians is in our hands and in our feet it's how we hit the drums it's how we you know and same with guitar or any instrument you know I think some uh, somebody could sit on my drums after I've played them, and I and when I play them, they sound the way I play, sound like me. Somebody else can sit behind them, and it's going to sound completely different. So I, I personally think a lot of it has to do with what's inside you and how you hit them and how it comes out. That's why, that's why I think it always sounds like me. And uh, unfortunately, I've never seen you guys live yet, but watching some video footage, it doesn't seem like you're hitting super hard, but mm. you're getting a really – strong clean sound particularly out of the snare and the kick hmm. um just an observation are there any thoughts on that but... i don't i don't i don't know what really really hard is <laughs> i mean i know I'm, I'm playing uh hard sometimes yeah sometimes i'm hitting what feels like is the most powerful i can do hmm. and there's other times when that's not necessary you know i think that's where dynamics might come in you know, it's all in how it feels at the time for me. I think that's what makes it be what it is. It makes me be me. Dynamics is something often overlooked with rock bands and, and loud guitars. Uh, do you think of dynamics in a volume thing or is it more of a density intensity kind of thing? I think probably both. Because volume is, it's its not all just in volume. It's, its again, all in how you hit it, you know. I mean, it might be softer, but still, if it doesn't have, I don't know if finesse is the right word, but it doesn't have that feel that's necessary, it's just going to sound like you're hitting your plan softer. You know, it won't, be, it, won't, it won't have that thing that's necessary, I feel. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. All right. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to probe you a little bit about your your gear. Okay. Um, <laughs> kick I'm such drum a gear guy <laughs> with a pillow hole, no hole, less muffling. How is it set up? Right now, I'm I'm, I'm using a there's a hole in my kick drum, and I'm using the um, Evans. I think it's called Emad. You know that has the like type of foam muffling thing in it already, and that's pretty much what I'm using. Wow, nothing extra inside the drum. Nothing I'm aware of. Unless my tech puts something in there sometimes. I'm not 
you know, not privy to. <laughs> but I think that's it, yeah. Now, what about your toms? Because they sound so full and resonant and clean. Do you put any tape or dampening on those? That just depends. I like to do it without anything, if if can be. But sometimes, I don't know if it's because of the the acoustics in the room or whatever it is, you know, there might be a ring that needs to be taken out. And sometimes tuning doesn't always do that. So you might have to put a little piece of tape or a little, you know, whatever that stuff's called on there to mm. dampen that. So basically whatever it takes to get the sound that works for the front of house and for me is what we do. That same with the snare drum, because you always have a pretty open sounding snare. Yeah. It, it's, I think it's that way with all the drums. Yeah. Whatever, whatever works is what we're going to do. Sweet. Yeah, man. Um, all right, you talked about your biggest symph- – oh, I have to ask this. This is a question I ask every guest. What was your first snare drum? Oh, my first snare drum. That's a funny story. I'm glad you asked that because it's a great story. I think my very first snare, it was a, it was a Ludwig. You know, this was 19 – probably 63 – I don't know exactly what it was called. I was four years old when I got it. So if I was four, it was probably 1961, maybe, 1961 or 62. And I remember I wanted it more than anything in life, is to have a real, just a real drum of any kind. And uh, my dad went to the store to get it for me. I remember staying home. And he comes back home and says, and he goes, comes up to me and says, Jerry, I'm really sorry, but I just wasn't able to get the drum. And I remember I just broke into like tears. I was just profusely crying. It's like the worst thing that I could ever imagine that could have happened to me is that he goes to get the drum. He comes back without it. And then he says, could you go out in the car? And I left something there. Could you go get that for me? And I walked out there. It's hard for me to tell the story almost without crying. But I walk out there, and there it was sitting on the front seat of the car. You know, I was like, "Oh, yeah." And that was, the, that was the, one of the greatest things. That that was my first snare. <laughs> Four years old, huh? I remember I had I had a toy kit before that, and I thought drums are the answer, man. I can get girls with drums because there's a picture of me. Uh, I think I'd fallen asleep or something behind my kit, my toy kit, and there's this little girl standing right next to me, like real close. <laughs> I'm thinking, all right, this is the answer. <laughs> so what what was it that got you even interested in the drums? You know, I really don't even know. It's like this is what I've always done. I think my earliest memory of seeing drums and being interested was probably around that age, if not earlier. But I think I was already playing when I saw this these drums. I went to an uncle's house. And he had this blue sparkle kit in his basement. And I just remember being so intrigued with it because it was real. You know, they were real drums. I think I was already interested. So, but I just don't know why I play drums. I just do. You know, I've never taken lessons or done anything like that. I just play. You know? Now, have you ever had a period of not wanting to play drums anymore? Like, yeah. And then what do you do? Do you just take a break or? Well, uh, well, I hardly ever play when I'm at home at all. I never practice, although I am practicing now because I have to learn these new songs off the new record. But uh, and during the pandemic, I was thinking, yeah, I, I don't know, man. I think I might be done. I think I'll just move on and find something else in life. You know, like I was saying, because everything was just so confusing to me. And I remember uh, in the hospital. After my second heart attack, I've had two heart attacks. First one killed me. Second one, I had open heart surgery, blah, 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 blah. I remember waking, being in the hospital after that one, thinking, you know, I think I might be done. I don't, I, I think I'm just going to not do this anymore. And I was at a party uh, talking to a friend after I got out of the hospital. I said, you know what? I think I'm just, I don't know if I want to play anymore. I think I'm just, I'm just not going to do it anymore. And he just kind of, he didn't yell at me, but he was very firm. And he said, no, you will play. You will get back out there and you will play because that's who you are and that's what you do. And so I wrote a song called She Called Me Home. It's on the new record that was 
uh, inspired by him telling me that. So now I'm playing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess. Yeah, I mean, that the past few years has been a trying time for everyone. But yeah, that I think just having such a long career, like when do you finally say, hey, let me try something else. Let me paint. You know, let me do anything yeah. else. Yeah, and I've always, and I've always, and I've always been a writer as well. I like to write. I've written stories and things like that. And I think about that. I think, hey, maybe I'll just do that. There have been times in my life I thought, if I could just be on an island somewhere and just write, that's all I did. That'd be great. But nothing's ever as fun as it seems, you know. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I just have to well, I mean. We're at the end here. So what's what's next? What's in store for King's X and what's in store for you moving forward? Well, we got some shows coming up. October, November. We're going to Tennessee and Kentucky and Texas. And uh, you know, hopefully this record can spark some interest in some people and we can keep doing this. You know? Have you been saying that about every record since the beginning? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, because we never know. I mean, I'm hoping, yeah, this would be great if something really could take off with this one. You know, I mean, we've been fortunate that we have a, a bit of a career, but, you know, the world doesn't really know who King's X is, I don't think. The musicians of the world do. You know, but, and, you know, we have some very, very loyal fans, but we haven't uh, penetrated the entire uh, general public. Yeah, that's, I often think, like, is it better, which side's better, blow up and fizzle out fast or or have 13 records over 35 years? Well, I'm hoping that we can uh, have a big record that fizzles out fast now because we've already had the past 13 years all that other crap. So let's just have a big record that makes us fizzle out. That'd be great. <laughs> I'm down. I'm ready. <laughs> oh, man. Well, again, congratulations. The record is incredible. Hope everyone checks it out. And hopefully you make it to Pittsburgh and I'll get to see you guys live. Yeah, it'll be great. And then until next time, keep grooving, man. I'll keep doing my best, man. <laughs> you do the same. <laughs>